Good morning. Today we are going to study about the eyeball. As we all know, eyeball is somewhat like a globe which is the organ of sight and closely resembles a camera which is helping for the production of images which we are seeing. It is a peripheral organ of vision. That is all other organs or the structures which are concerned with the vision are present inside like optic nerve, optic pathway, the contents of the optic pathway like optic nerve, optic chiasma, cerebral cortex, visual area functional area like visual area where receives the images or helping for the vision. So except eye all the other structures are present inside the cranial cavity. So the eye is the peripheral organ of vision which can be seen externally. How the vision occurs that is the lens which are present at the eyeball that produces the image fall on the retina. Retina is the innermost layer of the eyeball. So the image is produced by the lens and it falls on the retina. The retinal cell converts the light image to nervous impulses that passes through the optic nerve which, is, which are emerging from the retina and it passes continues through the visual pathway to reach the cerebral cortex, visual areas of the cerebral cortex to assume the image what we are seeing. So that is the route or passage of the vision. Location of eyeball. It is present at the anterior half of the orbital cavity. It is present at the anterior half of the orbital cavity. The shape and the size. It is spherical as we all know eyeball is a rounded structure or somewhat like a globe. So the shape and the size it is spherical and diameter of about 24 mm. This is the shape of an eyeball. The eyeball have got a spherical structure. The eyeball can be seen as a rounded structure with one anterior projected part anterior pole and a posterior opposite to the anterior most prominent part of the uh, anterior most part opposite that there is the posterior pole. So it is somewhat like 24 mm in diameter. So that is the shape and the size of the eyeball. The eyeball is, can be seen if we are dividing it into six parts. The posterior five-sixth is formed by the sclera, the white part of the eye which can be seen externally. The white part of the eye is the sclera and the anterior one-sixth is formed by the Cornea. That corneal part is transparent. The spherical posterior 5 6 diameter is 24 mm and the anterior 1 5th diameter, which is can be seen in a convex manner, that diameter is 15 mm. So that is difference and you can see upper eyelid here and lower eyelid. The fissure or the cavity or the space between the upper and lower eyelid through which we can see the eyeball that is known as the palpebral fissure. Upper eyelid is known as the superior palpebra and inferior palpebra so that the fissure which can be seen in between that is the palpebral fissure. 
so here the posterior five six can be seen in white color which is forming as a sclera and anterior one fifth is formed as the cornea which can be seen in transparent nature the sclera is opaque will not transmit the light while the cornea is transparent so that through the transparent cornea we can see the black coloration of the iris which are presenting itself inside the eyeball have got different layers or coverings you can call it as a tunics of eyeballs there are three layers outer fibrous cord forming as the sclera and cornea together outer fibrous cord consisting of sclera and cornea middle layer is the vascular cord consisting of choroid ciliary body and iris the inner nervous cord containing the retina so three layers can be or three tunics three layers can be seen as a covering of eyeball sclera cornea is the outer fibrous layer together forming as the outer fibrous layer choroid ciliary body and iris is just present inside the fibrous cord this is the middle cord or the vascular cord the inner nervous cord containing the retina which produces the which is responsible for the vision so these are the layers from outer to inner aspect the outer layer we can see that as the white colored sclera and the transparent cornea which is forming the outermost layer that is the fibrous cord inside that we can see a brown colored in this thing because the choroid have got pigmented cells so it appears as brown in nature it is helping for the refraction of the light which are entering into the completely it absorbs the lights which are entering into the eyeball so that the cavity or inside the eye appears as dark in nature that's why we are seeing through the pupil or the central cavity we are seeing the interior of the eyeball as dark in color so the cent central layer or the middle layer forming as a choroid anteriorly the choroid is extending as a ciliary body and from the ciliary body anteriorly again it is continuous as the iris a diaphragm which is present just in front of the lens so these are the this is a choroid which lines the sclera most of the sclera and anteriorly it is continuous as the ciliary body it is a extension from the choroid which contains the ciliary muscles and the projection in its ciliary processes and the ciliary body attaches to the lens by means of small ligaments that is the suspensory ligament of zone suspensory ligament the suspensory ligament of zonule of sin it is named as the zonule of sin and anterior to it there is the continuation of ciliary body as iris iris is forming as a diaphragm which controls the light entering into the lens through a small aperture present at the center of the iris that a small aperture or opening is known as the pupil so these are the layers innermost layer forming as a retina the retina have got again two layers outer pigmented layer inner sensory layer so from the sensory layer the nerve endings from the sensory layer there is a ganglion cells can be seen from the ganglia the fibers arises and passes through a region which is named as the optic disc to form the optic nerve fibers so these are the layers the outer fibrous layer middle vascular layer and inner nervous layer 
the outer fibrous layer consists of sclera and cornea as i have told you earlier which are continuous with each other they maintain major functions are providing the shape of the eyeball and supports the deeper structures external most protective layer is the sclera and cornea posterior physics is formed by the white opaque membrane that is named as the outer forming the sclera outer layer it is visible as the white part of the eye formed of dense fibrous tissue the sclera forming continuous with anteriorly sclera continuous anteriorly with the cornea the sclerocorneal junction is known as the nimbus sclerocorneal junction it is well marked externally the sclerocorneal junction is called as the limbus there is a specialized feature which is named as a scleral spur it is a triangular mass projects into the cornea behind the limbus the triangular mass projects into the cornea behind the limbus is known as the scleral spur we can see the scleral spur here a triangular mass which products which produces a projection a triangular projection behind the sclerocorneal junction there is a circular channel located in the sclera just behind the limbus it is named as a sinus venous sclerae sinus venous sclerae otherwise it is the canal of schlem the sinus venous sclerae it can be seen in relation with it is otherwise known as the canal of schlem it can be seen in relation with the limbus or sclerocorneal junction behind the limbus within the sclera there is a channel or a canal can be seen that is named as the canal of schlem the sclera completely covered externally by means of the conjunctiva so here we can see the conjunctiva the conjunctiva is the outer thin covering so completely it is covered with the conjunctiva sclera is covered with the conjunctiva only sclera is covered with the conjunctiva there are some structures which are piercing the sclera one is the optic nerve posteriorly optic nerve is piercing the sclera and posterior ciliary vessels and nerves they are supplying the eyeball so posterior ciliary vessels anterior ciliary arteries they are the branches of ophthalmic arteries then four choroidal veins these are the structures piercing the sclera the functions of the sclera they maintain the shape of the eyeball protects the internal structures and provide attachment to the muscles that moves attachment to muscles that moves which are named as the extra ocular muscles provides attachment to the muscles that moves the eyeball the extra ocular muscles the cornea forms the anterior one sixth of the outer fibrous layer so this is the anterior outer 1/6 of the outer fibrous layer that is forming as the cornea it is transparent and positioned centrally in front of the eyeball it is transparent and positioned centrally in front of the eyeball it is avascular and nourished by the capillaries of the limbus it will not possess any blood vessels instead it is avascular and the nourishment gets from the limbus limbus is the sclerocorneal junction the vessels of the limbus they gives nourishment they inverts the 
cornea to give nourishment. The cor cornea is highly sensitive and it is supplied by the ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve. That's why the cornea is highly light sensitive, highly sensitive and supplied by the ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve. It permits the entry of light and retracts the entering, diffracts the entering light. It permits because the rest of the portion of the external most cover of eyeball is opaque, will not permit the entry of light. Only this cornea is transparent so that the entry of light occurs through the cornea only. The junction of cornea to sclera externally marked as the sulcus sclerae, the portion where the cornea and the sclera, so the cornea and the sclera forming the junction is well marked externally on the eyeball that is named as the sulcus sclerae, sulcus sclerae. The avascular middle cord, sorry, vascular middle cord is otherwise known as uveal tract. It is very important five mark question, uveal tract. Uveal tract means that is the collection of choroid, ciliary body and iris. These three structures together named as the uveal tract, choroid, ciliary body and the iris. A vas uh, sorry, the vascular layer, the vascular layer of the eye. Being it is named as a vascular, that means it is majorly formed with the blood vessels, blood capillaries, like uh, the collection of blood vessels forming as the, or the capillary network will form as the middle layer. Most of the blood vessels of the eyeball can be seen in the middle layer. It consists of from behind forwards three components are there in the vascular or the middle cord, second cord, uh, inner to which lines inner to fibrous cord. That is choroid, ciliary body and iris. This is the pigmented middle layer which is formed by the choroid, anteriorly the ciliary body and iris. These are the three components of the uveal tract. Three components of the ureal, sorry, uveal tract, the choroid, ciliary body and the iris. Choroid means it is highly vascular with blood vessels. It is a structure which is formed with the blood vessels. A larger posterior part of the vascular cord. It is forming as the larger posterior part of the second vascular cord. It lines the inner surface of the sclera anteriorly connected to iris by the ciliary body. It lines the inner surface of the it lines the inner surface of the lines the inner surface of the sclera and it is continuous anteriorly. It is continuous anteriorly with the ciliary body. Continuous anteriorly with the ciliary body. And ciliary body is the anterior continuation of the choroid. The choroid is pigmented and pierced by the optic nerve posteriorly. The choroid is pigmented and it is it is pierced by the optic nerve posteriorly pierced by the optic nerve posteriorly that is here we can see the choroid is pierced by the optic nerve posteriorly it is containing the pigment cell that gives dark brown color it appears as dark brown in color because of the presence of pigmented cells in it. It prevents the reflection of light within the eyeball and making the interior of eyeball dark in nature. It prevents the reflection of light within the eyeball. It completely absorbs or refracts the light 
and so that it appears as black in nature. The layers of the choroid are the layers of the choroid are so we can see in this diagram this is the position of the choroid ciliary body and the iris so this uh, choroid again can be seen in different layers choroid can be again seen in different layers show you the diagram of choroid Okay, the choroid again can be seen in different layers. That is, the outer to inner, you can see uh, there is a suprachoroid lamina. Suprachoroid lamina is the structure or the layer which separates the sclera from the choroid. Superior aspect of choroid. So, the choroid gets separates from the sclera or in between the sclera and cornea there is a suprachoroid lamina. Then uh, the choroid is formed by outer vascular layer of arteries and vein and inner capillary layers. Outer layer which is formed with the blood vessels and veins and inner small vessels which are formed by the inner layer that is the capillary layer then it resting over a basal lamina basal lamina of brooch basal lamina of brooch which separates it from the retina so the choroid forms into four layers outer Suprachoroidal lamina, mid uh, inner basal lamina, and middle two layers of vascular layer and the capillary layer. All these are forming here in between the sclera and the retina. The basal lamina which is helping for the diffusion through which the nourishment passes to the outer layers of retina. So that is, so the, this is a function of the choroid which nourishes the retina. Or most of the blood vessels are present in it. So from the blood vessels the nourishment passes to the inner layers. The ciliary body. In this diagram we can see the ciliary body. The ciliary body. This is the ciliary body. It is the anterior thick continuation anterior thick continuation of the choroid anterior thick continuation of the choroid it is continuous with the iris in front continuous with the iris in front they suspends the lens this hold the lens in the position by means of suspensory ligament of lens by means of suspensory ligament of Lens. The suspensory ligament of lens is named as the zonule of sin. Zonule of sin. Sin means Z I N N. Zonule of sin. The suspensory ligament of lens. So the ciliary body. This is the thickened part of anterior choroid. Continuous anterior end of the choroid continues as a thick part. That is named as a ciliary pro, uh, body. From the ciliary body, the anterior continuation is the in front of the lens is the iris. And the ciliary body connected. 
to the lens by means of the uh, ligament of lens suspensory ligament of lens suspensory means it suspends the ligaments that's why so suspense is the lens to maintain the position and structure of the lens this comprises three parts the ciliary body comprises three parts the ciliary ring the it's a fibrous outer fibrous ring there is a ciliary ring which is formed by the outer fibrous ring and there is ciliaris muscle the um, muscles are present in two layers that is circularly running, running fibers and the obliquely running fibers so ciliary muscles ciliaris ring and the ciliary processes three components can be seen in the ciliary body ciliary ring is there ring means that is an outer fibrous ring continuous with the choroid outer fibrous ring continuous with the choroid is named as the ciliary ring and there is the ciliary muscles ciliary muscles are the smooth muscles consisting of the collection of smooth muscle fibers arranged in radially and circularly the main function is to focus the lens for the near vision that is a function it controls the size and structure of the lens position of the lens by pulling the sun suspensory ligaments it makes into flat lens by convex is the shape of the lens and by the action of the ciliary muscles it is helping to pull the suspensory ligament so that the lens becomes more flat so ciliary processes are the projections 6 to 60 to 90 60 to 90 60 to 90 60 to 90 inner uh, foldings can be seen these are the foldings representing the foldings that connects the uh, lens by means of suspensory ligaments that connects the lens to the ciliary process by means of suspensory ligaments and these are formed of complex capillaries which secretes the aqueous humor aqueous humor can be seen in a cavity in front of the iris and behind the iris the cavity in between the lens and the cornea is divided into is divided into anterior chamber and posterior chamber the cavity between the cornea and the lens is named as the anterior chamber and posterior chamber which is div divided by means of the iris in front of the iris that is the anterior chamber behind the iris is the posterior chamber so the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber are filled with the collection of fluid which is named as the aqueous humor so the ciliary body the ciliary processes are responsible for the production of aqueous humor as a plasma like fluid which can be seen in this cavity so that is about the ciliary body ciliary body is an anterior thickened continuation continuous with the iris in front this suspends the lens via the suspensory ligament composed of three parts ciliary ring ciliary muscle and ciliary processes ciliary ring is the outer fibrous ring process is the 6 to 90 60 to 90 foldings of inner aspect of ciliary body it is formed with the capillaries the ciliary muscle collection of smooth muscle which can be arranged in inner and outer layers the last component of the middle vascular cord is the iris it's a contractile diaphragm which 
permits the entry of light and controls the entry of light between the cornea and the lens it can be seen between the cornea and the lens the aperture can be seen at the center an aperture can be seen at the center that is named as the pupil an opening which can be seen at the center this is the pupil so this is a second layer the choroid ciliary body and the iris the layers of iris they form with anterior mesothelial lining the connective tissue stroma smooth muscle layer and layer of pigment cells these are the different layers forming in the in this part the iris iris is formed with anterior mesothelial lining which is presenting towards the externally then complete substance is formed with the connective tissue stroma where we can see the pigmented cells and the blood vessels so that this iris appears as dark in nature brown in color or black in color because of the pigmented cells can be seen in the connective tissue stroma stroma is a substance then smooth muscle layer which is helping for the contraction and relaxation of the iris controls the movement uh, uh, through which it uh, controls the entry of light the smooth muscle layer is formed by the dilator pupillae and constrictor pupillae which is helping for the uh, expansion of the pupil and the constriction of the pupil then the innermost layer is the layer of pigment cells so that it is appears as dark in nature the last layer is the inner nervous layer inner nervous layer is the retina inner nervous layer is formed by the retina retina is a light detecting component retina is a light detecting component from retina the nerve fibers arises from the ganglion layer to form the optic nerve that attaches to posterior pole of the eyeball this is the inner nervous cord the inner nervous cord of the retina it is a light detecting layer it is a light detecting layer because all other layers are the protective layers external most layer outer fibrous layer is the protective layer middle layer is the nourishing layer and the actual function of the eyeball as the vision isn't it so that vision is occur by means of the inner inner layer of the retina uh, the retinal nerve fibers are arises from the ganglion layer the retina can histologically the retina contains uh, major two layers the outer pigmented layer and inner sensory layer and this sensory layer again divided into 10 layers which contains the ganglions in it so from the ganglion cell layer of the retina the nerve fibers arises and they are responsible for the formation of optic nerve optic nerve which traverses out from the which receives the light sensation which traverses through the lens and hits in the retina and it converts the information or the uh, collection of this light into images or uh, it collects the uh, light entering into the eyeball and convert it into neuronal impulses and traverses through the optic nerve which can be seen through the posterior pole emerges through the posterior pole at a region which is named as the optic disc the optic nerve pierces the all the layers by means of a region or at a region that is named as the optic disc the optic disc means it is the uh, starting point of the or which uh, is the area through which the optic nerve emerges out 
it is the area without any photoreceptor cells are present in it so that this area is named as the blind spot without any photoreceptor cells are present at the optic disc area through which the optic nerve emerges out so that this area is named as the blind spot the optic nerve is pierced by means of a central artery of retina and a vein central artery of retina and a vein through the center portion of the optic disc it is pierced by the this is the optic disc representation of the optic disc here we can see the fibers arises and passes through the optic disc and the central artery of retina and vein that pierces the optic disc the optic part of the retina can be seen through the ophthalmoscopy the center of the retina can be seen as a macula lutea the center of retina is named as the macula lutea it can be seen in a yellowish color the macula lutea can be seen in a yellowish color it is the highly pigmented region where at the center there is a depression which is named as the fovea centralis the fovea centralis the central part of the retina can be seen as yellowish in color that is a macula lutea and at the center of the macula lutea there is a depression which is named as the fovea centralis this is the area of high concentration of light detecting cells this is the accurate vision area this is the area of accurate vision responsible for the high accuracy of vision the area that optic nerve enters the retina is known as the optic disc it contains no light detecting cells while the macula it is present near to the optic disc at the center of the retina there is a presence of a depression fovea centralis the macula lutea and the fovea centralis are responsible for the vision major vision the retina can be seen with the pigmented outer layer and sensory inner layer the pigmented outer layer is formed with a <coughs> single layer of cells it is attached to the choroid and supports the choroid in absorbing light it prevents the scattering of light within the eyeball so that is the function of the pigmented outer layer it continues around the whole inner surface of the eye so this is the pigmented outer layer pigmented outer layer lines the choroid and that is helping for the absorption of light prevents the reflection of light within the uh, eyeball next layer is the nervous or sensory cord neuronal or sensory layer or the nervous layer it consists of photoreceptor cells this is the layer inner layer the photoreceptor cells and ganglions all those things and the projection the processes of the ganglions forming the plexiform layers all these things can be seen in the nervous or pigmented layer which is responsible for the collection of light to make the images there are some special features which uh, so that is all about the four or three layers of the eyeball for the tunics that is about the discussion of the tunics or the layers of eyeball outer fibrous layer middle vascular layer inner retina outer fibrous layer which forming with the sclera and the cornea both are protective layers middle vascular layer is formed with the blood vessels and uh, like arteries veins together forming as the choroid ciliary body and iris all these structures that controls the light entry which lines the outer fibrous cord and the innermost layer is the retina 
which have got again two layers which is the outer layer supporting for the uh, to prevent the reflection of light or supporting the function of the choroid and the inner layer is the sensitivity layer or the sensory layer which is helping for the receiving of light. Now the common terms which are using in the eyeball is the anterior and posterior poles. The anterior pole is the most prominent part of the uh, anterior end of the cornea or at this, through the center of the cornea the most prominent part most projected part most uh, increased diameter can be seen in between the anterior and posterior poles so anterior uh, pole, uh, the eyeball is not presenting itself like a, a correct spherical structure around so that the anterior and posterior poles uh, can be seen like the most projected part anteriorly and posteriorly the more distance can be seen in between these two and exactly the optic nerve does not start or emerges out through the exact posterior pole but just as it is just posterior inferiorly to the posterior pole then the, uh, like the globe like the earth this is also forms some sort of uh, axis or the lines like the optometry we can say some of the specialized lines which are using to explain the visual pathway of uh, eyeball one is the axis of eyeball the axis of eyeball means that is the line joining the anterior pole to posterior pole. That is the long axis of eyeball. Then the optic axis. Optic axis means a line joining the center of pupil to the fovea centralis. That is optic axis. That means the light entering through the center of pupil and that is hitting posteriorly at the fovea centralis so the line connecting in between that is the line joining or that is the passage of light direction of the light so that it is named as the optic axis then the equator like the earth the equator is an imaginary line encircling the entire circular structure or the eyeball at the midway between the anterior and posterior poles so that is the other terms which are using in the other terms which are using in the eyeball another word the vitreous body and the aqueous humor the vitreous body means that is the structure which fills the posterior cavity posterior segment of eyeball here this is the posterior segment here it is the posterior segment so the posterior segment of the that is the cavity which is present behind the lens which lines with the uh, retina and the ciliary body ciliary processes and lens the cavity which is present inside it's lined with the or it is filled with a transparent gel like substance which is named as the vitreous body vitreous body it is marked by a narrow canal this that vitreous body the channel or the cavity is marked with a narrow canal which is named as the hyaloid canal which runs from the optic disc to the canal passes from the optic disc to the lens so this is the canal which is named as the hyaloid canal the vitreous body has three main functions it contributes to the magnifying power it magnifies through the light passes through this so that it magnifies the power of the eye and supports the lens and maintains the position of the lens and it holds the 
layers of retina in place so that is the entire cavity the spherical structure of the eyeball is by means of the vitreous body which is present inside it is maintaining the spherical structure and it is maintaining all the layers in position and the lens in position and also it magnifies the light entering into it the lens can be seen as by convex this is a lens the lens have got two projected sides anterior surface and the posterior surfaces are the projected so that it is by convex in nature it is by convex in nature it is attached to ciliary body it is attached to ciliary body the projections of the ciliary body ciliary processes by means of the suspensory ligament it connects the lens have got connection or it is in position it is kept in position by means of the suspensory ligaments which are connecting the lens to the or which holds the lens to the ciliary processes it is present behind the iris the lens is present behind the iris so that the light enters into the and hits the lens by controlled by means of the iris the posterior surface of the lens is lying in a depression of the vitreous body which is named as the hyaloid fossa the lens resting at a depression which is present in the vitreous body that is named as the hyaloid fossa then there are two cavities which are named as the anterior chamber and posterior chamber here is also we can see the anterior chamber and posterior chamber the blue colored area which represents in this diagram is the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber the anterior chamber and the posterior chambers are the cavities which can be seen in between the cornea and the lens which are divided into anterior and posterior chambers by means of iris both this are filled with the plasma like fluid that is named as the aqueous humor it's a clear fluid that is helping for the entry of light through it aqueous humor a clean clear plasma like fluid that nourishes the it gives nourishment and protects the eye so the two chambers anterior chamber and the posterior chambers are the cavities which can be seen in front of the lens between the lens and the cornea both are lined with or which are filled with the aqueous humor aqueous humor is produced continuously constantly with the trabecular meshware of the cornea the trabecular meshwork of the cornea which produces uh, any other anterior chamber which produces the aqueous humor the uh, pressure increases any blockage occurs in this uh, aqueous humor production from the canal of slum it is passes into the anterior chamber and posterior chamber so any blockage occurs any of the passage of the aqueous humor that can be lead to a clinical condition known as the glaucoma in which the increased ocular pressure the intra ocular pressure the pressure inside the eyeball will increases that can be lead to blindness this condition is known as the glaucoma So this is the anterior chamber and this is the posterior chamber. So that is all about the, uh, the things we have to remember, points we have to remember in the eyeball. And next is about its blood supply, venous drainage, lymphatic drainage and the nerve supply. Blood supply by means of the branches of ophthalmic artery. They are named 
central artery of retina the ophthalmic artery gives branches like central artery of retina which pierces the optic nerve then ciliary arteries the ciliary arteries again branches of the ophthalmic artery the ciliary arteries again divides into long and short ciliary arteries anterior ciliary arteries and there is the ophthalmic vessels of the uh, sorry the anterior and posterior ethmoidal vessels branches of the ophthalmic artery which can be seen that is also giving supply to the external aspect of the eyeball so these are the blood vessels which can be the number of blood vessels all these blood vessels contributing for the vascular layer so it is highly vascular so this is the uh, ophthalmic artery which give branches by ciliary vessels and central artery of retina all these things this is a diagram same diagram in a side view in this diagram you can see the collection of long and short ciliary vessels which are uh, an anterior ciliary vessels which can be seen this is, is the vascular cord you can see highly vascular region the blood supply the internal carotid artery not the carotid artery internal carotid artery gives the branches of the ophthalmic artery it gives posterior ciliary arteries uh, the muscular arteries and the retinal artery that is ophthalmic artery gives muscular branches and ciliary branches and the retinal artery retinal artery supplies the retina muscular artery for the extraocular muscles uh, which, uh, which is helping for the movement the muscles which are helping for the movement of eyeball to and fro the vision uh, for the vision so that is named as the extraocular muscles and posterior ciliary arteries supplying for the uh, um, uh, posterior ciliary and the anterior ciliary arteries they are supplying uh, or forming the major component of the choroid or the middle vascular cord the retinal artery passes into the retina and the optic nerve and it also passes to the branches or gives branches to choroid the anterior ciliary artery supplies the iris and the ciliary body so this is the blood supply how it appears the venous drainage externally it is passes to ophthalmic vein and angular vein and superficial temporal vein internally it is passes to it is externally it is passes to angular vein facial vein and the superficial temporal vein on the sides internally it is passes to cavernous sinus by means of ophthalmic superior ophthalmic and inferior ophthalmic veins it drains into the cavernous sinus the lymphatic drainage externally it is passes to uh, only the external group of lymph nodes in inside the uh, cranial cavity there is no lymph node so it is, all the lymph nodes are present outside the uh, eyeball so uh, it is passes to superficial parotid lymph nodes and submandibular lymph nodes superficial parotid lymph nodes which are present at the parotid fascia on the parotid gland and submandibular nodes which are present uh, superficial to submandibular gland so that is the lymphatic drainage the nerve supply uh, there are six cranial nerves which giving supply to eyeball by means of uh, the optic nerve which is helping uh, for the transmission of nerve impulses the oculomotor nerve is the nerve which supplies the muscles it is a motor nerve to the eyeball it supplies the muscles of the uh, uh, major muscles of the eyeball extraocular muscles and trochlear nerve abducens nerve also giving branches to the uh, uh, muscular branches the trochlear oculomotor and abducens they are the nerves which are supplying the extraocular muscles the trigeminal nerve which is sensory to the eyeball external aspect and the um, upper eyelid lower eyelid all these are supplied by means of the branches of trigeminal nerve and the facial nerve facial nerve also supplies the muscle of the uh, eyelid the supra or uh, the, uh, the superior uh, ma the muscles which are forming the 
um, levator palpebrae superior is the external most muscle which is helping for the opening of uh, eyeball and also the muscle which is presenting the surroundings of the eyeball that is the uh, orbicularis oculi so this uh, uh, muscles which are present externally to the eyeball that is separate by means of the facial nerve so these are the cranial nerves optic nerve oculomotor trochlear trigeminal abducens and the facial they are the nerves which are optic nerve is the second nerve oculomotor third nerve trochlear fourth nerve trigeminal fifth nerve abducens sixth nerve and facial nerve so second to seventh cranial nerve they are responsible for the nerve supply of responsible for the nerve supply of the eyeball this is how the nerves entering into it you can see the different nerves optic oculomotor trochlear ophthalmic nerve that is the branch of trigeminal nerve and abducen nerve now that is all about the eyeball now the applied anatomy why we are learning the eyeball Conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis is the inflammation of the conjunctiva. The inflammation of the conjunctiva is known as the conjunctivitis. Another clinical condition which is named as the black eye. The black eye, we have studied the black eye in the case of uh, scalp. Black eye means that is the collection of blood within around the upper and lower eyelid the intracranial um, or at the layer of loose areolar tissue the collection of blood can be lead to upper eyelid and the lower eyelid this being it is continuous each other that is named as the black eye then glaucoma is the pressure increase of the pressure inside that can be damaged the optic nerve lead to loss of vision it is named as the glaucoma and cataract cataract means that is the opacity of the lens due to increased age the absorption of ultraviolet radiations can be lead to uh, opacity of the lens can be seen in older ages and that is named as the cataract the opacity of the uh, lens is named as the cataract then retinal detachment another important applied anatomy is the retinal detachment retinal detachment means it is the detachment of the retina from the inner surface of the choroid the gluco uh, then uh, retinoblastoma retinoblastoma is the cancer that can be caused to retina so that is all about the eyeball the eyeball is the organ of vision with three layers which are supporting the receiving of light and converting light into a vision it is supplied by the branches of ophthalmic artery. It is supplied by the cranial nerves. Second to seven cranial nerves in different way. And ultimately the venous drainage drains into the cavernous sinus. The intracranial venous sinus, cavernous sinus. And the eyeball have got a number of applied aspects there is another term which is named as a press biopia or short vision press biopia means uh, the lens plays an important role in the accommodation as a result of increased age the power of accommodation is lessened producing a clinical condition known as the short vision or the press biopia press biopia 
the retinal detachment means that is the retinal detachment means that is the separation of two layers of the retina from the choroid so that is another important applied anatomy then another important applied anatomy is the corneal reflex corneal reflex is excited by gentle touching of the cornea which is helping for the uh, which is resulting for the closing of eyeball or closing of eyelids any structure which is passes towards the eyeball that can be lead to retinal reflex lead to the closure of eyelids it is named as a retinal reflex then optic pathway is the term which is using for the passage of light from the op uh, from the um, passage of light from the optic nerve to optic chiasma passes to the passes to the midbrain from there it reaches the visual pathway which reaches to the visual area of sensation which can be seen at the occipital lobe of cerebrum named as the visual area 17 18 and 19 the number which is using for it is 17 18 19 that will it is the area of vision at the occipital lobe of cerebrum there it hits the there is a interpretation of the uh, image occurs so that's all about the eyeball thank you